Let's pray. Father, I just want to come before your throne this morning, thanking you that it's a throne of grace. Father, that where sin doth abound, grace does much more abound. And that, Father, once we're in the family, we're forever in the family. And even though we have days that are not as good as other days, Father, if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. And once we've been washed holy, sometimes our feet get dirty. And Jesus said, just uh, we come back for that, uh, that uh, washing, if you will. So, Father, I love you. God, we're going to look at the helmet of salvation and the importance of it in the life of a believer. Please, Holy Spirit, anoint my words. Take them from the ear to the heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've not come to our Bible study. Yes. Cool background music when I preach. Yeah, I won't. Uh, men, just remember, we're going to be on Mar- Mark chapter 4 this week. Uh, and so if you'll just read Mark chapter 4, if you've not been yet, but you're going to come this week, and we're going to concentrate on the parable of the sower that's found in Mark 4, and so you'll be up to speed. And I know a couple of you need books. We're trying to get them in. Lord willing, we'll have them in early this week. Uh, two of our people are in the hospital, Ray Vanover is in. Um, he's been in there uh, with some chest complications. They told him this morning or late last night that they don't think it's his heart, so praise God for that, that it might be muscular, and so depending on what they decide to do, he'll either come home later today or in the morning, and that's obvious if there's no more complications, but pray for him and Amelia, uh, uh, and just for Ray's health, and then secondly, uh, we want to lift up uh, Ronnie Blackburn's wife, Sherry, who is now in the hospital uh, she's in uh, Deaconess, 5512 or something, but you can ask at the front door. It's on my phone, and she's complaining of uh, some breathing issues, and so we want to lift up Sherry as well. And like I always say, if you go out to eat today, uh, you know, in Evansville, and, and you got a second, pop by, just say hello, hug her neck, say a prayer. Um, you don't have to stay a long time, and probably it wouldn't be good for you to stay a long time, but uh, and if you can't do that, ship a text to them. Let them, Ray and Sherry know, Ronnie, Amelia, that you love them and that you're praying for them. So, um, and I think we're squared away now. That's where we're at. Okay. Listen, I want to give a praise report. We've had double, if not triple, the amount of men coming to men's Bible study. Okay. Yeah. Amen. I pray that we keep that up. This, this, uh, we're, we're looking at the gospel of Mark, and the whole purpose of the gospel of Mark is to point the light to Jesus. And so I want our men to know Jesus. I want them to know how to follow Jesus. And uh, I, want them, I want us to understand the teachings of Jesus. And so uh, pray for these men. Pray. And wives, support your husbands coming to this. And if that means you got to watch the kiddos, and he's been gone all day, and now he's got to go to Bible study, and so now you got the kids at night, then praise God that he's willing to come. Amen? And so please, please, please uh, support the men as they uh, try to uh, learn and follow and uh, discuss what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so thank you, men, for coming. Today, we are on the fifth piece of the armor uh, that Paul is uh, telling us that we need to put on. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 tells us why it is that we're to put on this armor. And by the way, when we put it on, it's daily. It's not a one-time put on, but it's every day of our life. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Remember this, you are not a match for Satan in your own strength. He will kick you in the head, okay? We need to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. Paul's telling them, don't put on pieces. It's not a smorgasbord. You don't just get to pick a piece here and a piece there. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, obviously, if we need to put on the full armor of God to to withstand those schemes, what happens when we don't put it on, right? We're no match for his schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
Therefore, because that's true, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and, have ev- ha- and having done everything to stand firm. And then verses 14 through 16, we've looked at. We, we're not going to break them down, but let's read them just so we, you know, the context of everything. The first four pieces of the armor are found in 14, 15, 16. It reads this way. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having you shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of Jesus, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And so today we are on that fifth piece. It's found in Ephesians six seventeen, in which Paul says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So those will be the next two things we look at. I want you to remember all of this armor is for defense. Okay? Paul's only going to give us one thing for offense, and that's the word of God. So we put on this armor that we've been looking at to defend ourselves against the attacks of the enemy, right? If you don't put it on, you'll be susceptible to those attacks. And I probably don't need to tell you that because if some of you are fe- living defeated lives, what the Holy Spirit would want you to know is how you cannot live those defeated lives by putting on the armor of God. We're going to look at that fifth piece today, the helmet of salvation. If you'll put up the picture of the soldier there, we're looking at the helmet of salvation, okay? And let me just leave this up there. Let me tell you about the helmet that they wore. The helmet worn by the ancient soldier was of the utmost importance. The helmet was either made of thick leather covered by plates of metal or was made of solid metal that was beaten into the shape of the human head, hopefully before they actually put it on their head. Most ancient helmets had metal extensions that covered the cheeks. Do you see how it comes around? These extensions were designed to protect the sides of the face, obviously. What was the purpose of these helmets for the Roman soldier? It was designed to protect the head. In ancient times, many armies employed cavalry. These soldiers were mounted on horseback, and most carried a sword that was called a broadsword. That broadsword was a two-hand, uh, excuse me, a two-handed sword that was usually between three and four feet in length. It had a double-edged, double-edged blade. This sword was swung by mounted soldiers in an effort to either split the skulls of the enemy or to decapitate them. The helmet helped to deflect the blows of the broadsword, and thus it protected the foot soldier from injury. That's what it was for for the Roman soldier. What about for the spiritual soldier? What is the helmet of salvation? Let me first tell you what that's not. So first point, what the helmet of salvation isn't. Paul isn't telling these Christians that this helmet is meant to be putting on so that they are saved. Remember, he's talking to Christians when he's talking about the full armor of God, right? Uh, And so it's really important that you understand every morning, I'm not putting this back on so I can be saved again. No, no, no. This is the armor of a Christian that God has given us to withstand the attacks of the enemy. So it's not meant that the helmet of salvation is that you get saved by putting it on. Okay, now remember, Paul has already told these Christians in this letter, and it was a letter, not a, not a book, not a chapter, not verses. It was a letter back early in the letter. Paul had already said to them in Ephesians 2, 4 through 9, he says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And then the famous verse that we most of us probably know if we've been saved very long for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not as a result of works so that no one may boast. What Paul means here about the helmet of salvation isn't that by putting it on, you're going to be saved. This helmet, whatever it is, it's not to save us. It's after we're saved, we're to put on this helmet of salvation. And what he means is that we are to stand in the full assurance 
of the salvation we possess in the Lord. We are hold on to the truth that if we are saved, the Lord has redeemed us and he has promised everlasting life. You don't lose it, friend, if you got it. Sometimes, and some denominations will teach that, that you can lose your salvation. And I think sometimes they, they probably do that because they'll see someone make a profession of faith, and then three months later, they're living like hell, and, and they don't know how to reconcile. Uh, and so they say, man, you can't be once saved and always saved if you're going to do this stuff. But the truth is, once you're in the family of God, you're in the family of God. It doesn't mean you'll be perfect. You won't be. Let me just burst that bubble right now. How many of us have been saved longer than a week and don't understand that yet we still get our feet dirty? Right? That's just the truth. And, and so, you, did, you listen to me. Hear me well. You did not get saved because you were good enough. You didn't get saved because you stopped your addictions. You didn't get saved because you're a better husband or a better wife or a better parent or a better child. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God. Do you understand that? The truth is you didn't do anything for your salvation. God did it all for you. Because, Amen. Give him a hand. Praise God. Listen to me. It, so, so what we're going to learn today is that this helmet of salvation is to be put on as, as a reminder that we are saved. Not to get saved, but that we already are saved. And I know sometimes we do a poor job of showing what a saved person looks like. Sometimes we are hypocrites. <laughs> no amens to that, okay. <laughs> sometimes we don't practice what we preach. We're, we all fail God. All right, we are, and, that, and that's why First John tells us if we sin, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. But you don't, you're not saved because you're good enough. You don't keep it because you're good enough. Because some people have this backdoor works. In other words, okay, pastor, I agree. Ephesians 2, 8 makes it pretty clear. For by grace are you saved through faith. Okay, but then you know what they preach? That somehow we're gonna keep it by works. And so they're frustrated. It doesn't even mean they're not saved. They're just frustrated Christians. Any Christian that thinks you're going to keep it by your own effort, you are one of the most frustrated, irritable, self-righteous, judgmental people on this earth. You know why you're frustrated? Because everyone else isn't doing what you're doing. And you don't have a full understanding of what grace is, which the simplest definition I can give you is the unmerited favor of God. You do nothing to receive salvation. Yeah, but pastor, my faith, man, I can show you through the Bible, God grants you the faith that you're saved by. Why? Verse nine tells us why. If you have any part of your salvation, guess what you get to do, human being? You get a boast, right, Sally? We get a boast. If you're here and, and you ask Jesus in your life, but Jamie doesn't, you can look at her and say, she's dumb as a stump, man. She, I mean, obviously, look how wise I am. I, I, I listened and I got it. She didn't. Well, what's wrong with her? We are human beings and we are prone to boasting. One of the reasons we like a work salvation is because it puts the attention on us. That's what was wrong with the Jews of Paul's day. That's why he said in Romans 10, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They were trying to earn their way to heaven through self-righteous acts rather than accepting the righteousness that comes by faith through grace in Jesus Christ, okay? All that's for free because that's not even what I want to preach. <laughs> what is this helmet of salvation? If it's not that when we put it on, we get saved, but we're to put on this helmet of salvation because we are saved and it's to protect against the blows of the enemy, right? Remember, Paul saw the Roman soldier and the Holy Spirit inspired him to write about spiritual armor by using the armor that he was seeing on Roman soldiers. And so the helmet was to protect the head. 
from the blows of the enemy. We already have seen what the, the blows of the enemy are what? They're schemes. They're traps. And what Satan wants to do in your life, if you're a believer, it's really simple. He wants to discourage you and create in you a doubt about God. And if he can do that, and, and by the way, you really deep theologians, it can happen. When John the Baptist was in prison waiting to lose his head, he sent two disciples to Jesus. Now, this is the same John that had already said, Behold, the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sin of the world. This is the same John that saw a, uh, heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. This is the same John that the Bible tells us is a forerunner for Christ, right? To make paths straight for when Jesus... This is that John, the John that Jesus later says, There's no one born of woman greater than this man. But in a moment of crisis... He doubted. And when I was a young Christian, I was a harsh, hard Christian. As you get older in the Lord, you begin to realize life is difficult. It is. If I were to ask you today to raise your hand, and I won't, but raise it in your brain, have you ever doubted your salvation? Have you ever, maybe through actions that you've done or thoughts that you've had or just a lack of interest in the things of God, have you ever doubted your salvation? Have you ever been discouraged because of your doubt? You see what I'm saying? Doubt generally comes before discouragement. All right, and we're going to look at that. I want to read you something out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. It's going to give us a little insight as to what this helmet is for. You ready? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8. Paul says, But since we are of the day, meaning of the light, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, you ready? And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Let me read that again. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath. Aren't you glad, Christian, that you will never taste the wrath of God? Jesus has rescued us from the wrath. If you're here today and you are unsaved, you are not born again, you've not been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the wrath of Almighty God hovering above your head. And I, 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 was, I, I, was, you know, I, I was listening to a guy preach and he was, saying, he was saying what I say all the time about the reason why we don't share the good news is because inherent in the good news is the bad news. What are we telling people they need to be rescued from? Sin. Well, if we're telling them they need to be rescued from sin, that means they're sinners. And if that means they're sinners, that means the wrath of God abides on them. And if they die uh, outside of Jesus Christ, the Bible says they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. That's what the Bible says. And one of the reasons we don't see more people uh, 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 born again is because we, we love to tell half the truth, the good news. But friend, the good news is the good news because of the bad news. Do you understand that? Paul is telling us, put on the helmet. Why, Paul? Because this helmet represents the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, and that word asleep there means death, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. So we're to, we're to encourage one another. If you come in sucking lemons or you, you, know, you, you look like Eeyore or you're, you know, you, you know I, when my kids were young, it was Winnie the Pooh. And Winnie, Winnie had a friend named Eeyore who was about as depressed a animal as you're ever going to find. I mean, he, he, whatever he could find bad is what Eeyore concentrated on. He was a depressed, is he, was he a donkey, Eeyore? Yeah, he was a donkey. And he was depressed. And, and, and far too many Christians are like that. And here's what we do. We come in, we sit, we hope Jim has a good sermon, we sing some songs, and we don't really get to know one another. 
Like we ought to be able to see it in each other's countenance how we're doing. But if we're self-absorbed and all we care about is getting what we want to get out of this day, we'll miss it. Paul says that we should encourage one another. Why? Because as a helmet, we're putting on the hope of salvation. Now, we already saw that he wasn't talking about being saved. He covered that in chapters 1 and 2 of this letter. He's talking to Christians. But now Paul is telling us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, which actually matches what he's meaning in, uh, in Ephesians uh, 6 and verse 17, the helmet as the hope of salvation. There are, I don't know if you know this, but there are what many consider three stages of salvation. Now, don't panic. If you're saved, you're saved. <laughs> so don't panic when I teach this, all right? What do I mean by that? Well, first, when we're saved, we're saved at the foot of the cross, right? We've announced to God what he already knows, that we're sinners deserving of wrath and judgment, but that we now believe by the grace of God in the Son of God and his sacrifice on the cross for us and his glorious resurrection on the third day. And from that day till I'm called home or Jesus comes back, my faith, my trust, my hope is in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we're saved. Praise God, we're saved. Now, from that day till the day you die or Jesus comes back, you're being saved. What? Yeah. We're being saved. Well, does that mean you could lose it if you're being? No, no, no. No, no. Get that out of your mind. I'll show that at the end. We are being saved. What do I mean? As we go through this life, as God has placed his spirit in us, and he has as a pledge of our inheritance, Ephesians 1, right? So we are saved at the cross we're being saved as we go through the rest of our life. And then one day, our salvation will be made complete when Christ comes for his bride, the church. Amen? We're saved at the cross. We're being saved. And one day, the hope of our salvation will become a reality. 1 John 3 discusses this. When John writes in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. Isn't that awesome to be called a child of God? Like, I didn't have a daddy, all right? My daddy was an alcoholic, left us when I was just a baby. I never had a dad. My first dad I ever had was my heavenly father. And so, so when I found out that when I was in God's family that I was his child, that meant something to me. And so he says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And such we are for this reason, what reason? That God has bestowed his love on us and that we're called the children of God. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Who's the him there? Jesus. Beloved. Isn't that a great term for Christians? We're the beloved of God. Beloved. Now we are children of God, okay? So he's speaking of the initial salvation we get at the cross. We're being saved. Now notice, now he's going to talk about that third part, that one day our salvation. He says, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. Hmm. We know that when he appears, who's he? Jesus. We know that when he appears, get this. We will be like him. Amen. Huh? Amen. That's the hope of my salvation. One day Jesus is coming back, and when he does, and the trumpet's blown, and the shout is given, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we who are alive shall be gather up together with them, be with him forever. We are going to be transformed in a twinkling of an eye. Come on now. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. I almost didn't put this in here because I knew I'd go crazy. <laughs> what John is writing in 1 John chapter 3, he said, we don't know what we'll be like, but we know we're going to be like him. And when he comes, and the dead in Christ shall rise, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we who are alive, if we're still alive when that happens, the dead in Christ are going to rise, we're going to rise we're, and then we'll be caught up in the air together with them, and we're going to be with Jesus forever. And the Bible says, comfort one another with these words. What happens, what happens when the dead come out of the grave and we who are alive are changed to be like God? You want to know what happens? 
Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. In other words, friend, our flesh and blood has a sin nature, and Sally, that's not welcome in heaven. You understand that? It's not welcome in heaven, so we got to be changed, y'all. Right? Look at this. Check it out next verse. Behold, in other words, pay attention. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Why is it a mystery? Because we haven't actually experienced it yet. It's something up ahead. It's the hope of our salvation. We haven't experienced it. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. And I know what Hebrews 9 teaches. The point of man wants to die and after this is judgment. But there will be a generation of believers that are alive when Jesus comes back. And if that's so, they will not taste death. Physical death. We're already spiritually dead before Christ, but physically I'll go back. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, this is for the church, the bride of Christ. This isn't for the world. What, what Paul's writing about is for the bride of Christ. Look at verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of, you know, the only twinkle I ever get is when my wife looks at me. And I get that twinkle in her eye, and then I give her one back. And we have this amazing moment of connection. How quick is a twinkling of an eye? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, meaning we will never taste death from that point on, right? Right now, we have perishable bodies. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, we groan in these earthen tents to be clothed from on high. Why? Because these tents decay. Uh, they, 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 we have that sin that we got to battle, but one day we're going to be clothed from on high. This is it. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Verse 53. For this perishable, this, this earthen tent, must put on the imperishable. And this mortal must put on immortality. Verse 54. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then, listen to me, we've got to quit saying this. It bothers the fire out of me. There is sting in death right now. We've got to quit quoting this. It's not true yet. You understand me? There is sting in death. I have been by too many bedsides of dying people and see the sting of death that they go through, right? So quit quoting this yet. This is for up ahead when Jesus comes back after the shout, right? Then all this becomes true. What comes true? Then, then... Then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Is death swallowed up in victory right now? In one sense it is, but not in the absolute sense because we're still all going to die unless Jesus comes back in our lifetime. But when they, oh, go back. Yeah. So then, when then, when the shout, when Jesus returns for his bride, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? It's then that we're going to say this. Not now. And by the way, isn't it a great hopeful thing that one day we're going to be able to say this? That death will no longer have any sting? The grave will have no longer a victory over the life of a believer? This is the hope of our salvation, that all of this is going to come to pass. And look at, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. 57, but thanks be to God who gives us, now, did we earn this victory? No. God gives us this victory. Thanks be to God the Father who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God the Son. Verse 58, 
Therefore, because all of this is going to happen, the hope of our salvation is going to become a reality. In 1 John 3, John says, we don't know what we'll be like, but we know we're going to be like Jesus. Immortal, unperishable, without sin. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And friends, that brings me to what I want to tell you about the importance of the helmet. Because the helmet is to protect our head. In our head is our mind. And what does Paul mean by the putting on the helmet of salvation? Listen to me. Just as the Roman soldier's helmet was used to protect the soldier's head from the attacks of the enemy, the helmet of salvation, the hope of our salvation, the completion of our salvation, is to protect us against the schemes of the enemy as he tries to attack our minds. Listen, you've heard me say this many times. Whoever controls this controls you. Whoever controls this controls you. Right? You know that's true. Well, I didn't mean to do that sin. No, yeah, yeah, you did. You meant to do that sin. You thought about it and acted on it. But you don't want to admit that, right? Because that's, that's a horrible thing to admit as a Christian that we chose something over Jesus. It doesn't mean you're not saved, but it does mean at that moment you wanted to sin more than you wanted to please Jesus. The helmet of salvation is to protect us against the schemes of the enemy as he tries to attack our minds. There's two ways Satan loves to attack, come against a Christian. Here they are. You ready? He wants to to cause doubt, and born out of the doubt is discouragement. That's how Satan wants to attack your mind as a believer. He wants to cause you to doubt God. Now, there are many ways we doubt God. John MacArthur says this, to discourage us, Satan points to our failures and sins, our unresolved problems, our poor health, or to whatever else seems negative in our lives, that, that he wants us to get to blame God. After all, if God is sovereign... And he can do anything. Why are you suffering? And please don't do this. I've heard this too many times. God understands if you're mad at him. That's not true. That's a lie of the enemy. He wants you to be mad at God. Because if you're mad at God, you're not listening to God. You're not following his son. You understand what I'm saying? There have been many a person that's left the church mad at God or mad at the preacher because something didn't go the way they thought it should. They prayed for something. It didn't happen. Ted Turner, who used to own the Braves and created CNN and all that, his sister got deathly ill. When God did not heal her, he decided he hated God and didn't want anything to do with God and walked away from even the concept of God. That's the work of Satan. John 10, 10, the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. He can't rob you of your salvation, but what he wants to do, Christian, is to create doubt in your mind. John, uh, MacArthur says, to discourage us, Satan points to our failures, our sins, our unresolved problems, our poor health, or to whatever else seems negative in our lives, in order to make us lose confidence in the love and care of our Heavenly Father and His promises. If He can get us to doubt God, then He's got us right where He wants. Isn't that how He got Eve? Did God really say that you'd die? And Eve should have never even entertained the conversation, but she did. And what, that, what the serpent got Eve to do was to doubt God. God said, if you t- eat it, you're going to die. The enemy got her to doubt that. And once he got her to doubt it, then sin was created. Christian, one of the worst things that can happen is that you doubt God. Okay. One of the worst things, define doubt simply. That here's your definition of doubt. You ready? A feeling of uncertainty. You ever had that as a Christian? Man, I've been praying over something for so long. I got this lost husband, and man, it's been 20 years I've been praying. And, and man, God, are you even there? Are you even listening? Listen to us when we say those things. Hebrews 11, 6 says what? But without faith, it is impossible to believe God. Without faith, it is impossible to, to, to please God. And if we don't please him, guess what you won't get? The answers to your doubts. Doubt is a feeling of uncertainty. Spiritually, Satan wants us to doubt God, his commands and his promises. And if we let him do this, and he can, we become easy marks for his lies and we'll find ourselves sidelined from fulfilling the good works that God has for us when he saved us. What, what Satan wants to do with you, Christian, is to get you to sit on the sidelines of life. 
and he does it by doubt. You're not going to go into the battle if you're doubting the one who sent you. You're going to take a time out and go sit on the sidelines. And then you're not going to be advancing the gospel. You're not going to be sharing the gospel. You're not going to be going out and making disciples because you have doubt about all of it yourself. Doubt, doubting God, leads to discouragement. Let me tell you what dis- discouragement is. Discouragement is, by definition, a deficit of courage. Discouragement is, by definition, a, a deficit of courage. Remember what God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. He was getting ready to lead the people of God, and, uh, the Old Testament people of God, into the promised land. And what did God tell Joshua over and over? Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Listen, to walk the Christian life in this dark place takes courage. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy 3. He said, all those that would live godly shall suffer persecution. That's why a lot of us aren't living godly. We don't want the heat. We want our friends. We want to be liked. Wherever we go to work, we just, you know, we just sort of do the passive Christianity thing. That's not what God's told us to be and not what to do. We don't have a spirit of fear, Paul told Timothy, a young pastor, who, by the way, was pastor of Ephesus when he wrote it to him. But of, uh, but of dunamis, of power. Discouragement is, by definition, a deficit of courage. Biblical courage is the ability to face uncertainty, adversity, danger, or suffering with faith, fueled, with, excuse me, with faith-fueled hope that God will keep his word to us, come what may. So discouragement is losing the ability to face the trials and tribulations that inevitably come our way through the attacks of the enemy. And when he gets us there, we call a big fat timeout on serving God. You are not serving God when you doubt and you're discouraged. You know, if I could give you the time and the mic, what would you say? Would you admit that? Whenever I've doubted God about something, I don't exactly want to leap into the flames of the battle. That's what the helmet of salvation is for, the the hope of our salvation. We put it on every day, and so we never lose sight of the fact of what's up ahead for us because of what Jesus has already done for us, and we're moving towards that hope of our salvation that one day we will become like Jesus, changed in the twinkling of an eye, and the two things that sideline Christians is doubt and discouragement. You say, what about sin? Sin is born out of doubt and discouragement. Sure, it's sin, but what gets us to sin is doubt and discouragement. Elijah went through this after the great victory on Mount Carmel. I don't have time to preach that. I wish I could. 1 Kings 18, 36 through 40, uh, when the uh, prophets of Baal were up on the mountain and, and they went first and whoever could get the, the fire to come down out of the heavens and, and, and he mocked them. It was pretty cool, actually. <laughs> Maybe you need to yell a little louder. And, and, and obviously they couldn't make it happen. And then he had them pour buckets of water all over the, his altar and it was like a moat around it, soaked wood. And God consumed it with the fire from heaven. What a victory. And then, and, then, and then Elijah told them to kill all the 450 prophets of Baal. And they slaughtered them. With that kind of victory, with that kind of experience, surely Elijah would never, ever doubt and be discouraged. Not after that, right? Surely not. Well, let's look at 1 Kings 19, 1 through 4. Now, remember, he just had the people slaughter 450 prophets of Baal. He called on God, and God consumed the altar. Remember what he asked them before, and how long will halt you between two opinions? If God be God, follow him, and Baal be, you know. Like, he was so frustrated with the people because they wouldn't even answer him about who God was. Because they doubted, and they didn't want destroyed by the prophets of Baal. Notice what happened. This is Elijah, too. This isn't just like some run-of-the-mill Christian. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Jezebel was the pagan wife of Ahab. And how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Not good prophets. He was the prophets of Baal. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods, little g-gods, Little G gods, do to me and even more. Oh, lady, you have no idea. You have no idea. 
So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow by this time. In other words, you know what she said? I'm putting a hit out on you. I'm telling you it's going to come in the next 24 hours. You're dying. I'm going to do to you what you did to the prophets of Baal. You know Elijah stood up and said, bring it on. I mean, <laughs> if I, we just wiped out 450, y'all, lady. Bring it on. Because surely that's what a man of God would say who had that kind of victory. Let's see. And he was afraid. What? What? How? How was he afraid? God had just granted this massive victory. He knows God is God. He saw the work of God on that mountaintop. And now, because one woman said, I'm coming after you. The Bible says Elijah was afraid. You know when we get afraid? When we doubt God. That's why God tells over 300 times the Bible, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. You know what we do? We fear, we fear, we fear. Because we take our eyes off of God and his word and his promises, and we put them on whatever the circumstances that's creating the fear in our life. Right? And then we don't want any well-meaning Christian to tell us we need to slay <laughs> that, that fear. We get mad, right? Because, no, 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 I have a right to be scared. 300 times God says, fear not, Christian. Over 300. If God says it once, it's right. If he says it over 300 times, I think he wants us to what? Fear not. But Elijah was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life. He ran for his life. What? And came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. In verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself, you ready? This is his request to God, that he might die. But I'm going to die anyhow. God, I'd rather you take me. And said, you ready? It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. Now, if you read on, he, he, God restores him in a beautiful, wonderful way. I don't have time to go into all that. What I am showing you is our humanity. You're not above fear, doubt, and discouragement, Christian. It happens. And it doesn't mean you don't love God. It means for a moment you've had, uh, you've had a moment. You know, when did Peter walk on water? Lord, if it's you, send me to it. And he starts walking on water. Dude, a storm, he's walking on water. And what does the Bible say Peter did? He took his eyes off of Jesus and looked at the storm. And guess what? <laughs> because without faith, it is impossible to please God. When his eyes were on Jesus, he did the unthinkable, the unimaginable. But when he took his eyes off of Jesus and put them on his circumstances, he sank. Christian, you know when you get full of fear, doubt, and anxiety, and discouragement? When you take your eyes off of Jesus, you, you quit immersing yourself in the Word of God. And once you do that, you're not fortified by the truth. You don't have your loins girded with truth. And when that doesn't happen, then you're no longer set free by the Word of truth, John 8, 31 and 32. Are you listening to me, Christian? Like on the one hand, I want you to be encouraged that even when you're discouraged, you're still God's. Even when you have a moment of doubt, as John the Baptist did, because he knew his life was coming to an end, you're still God's. And if the helmet of salvation is the hope of our salvation, in other words, that God will complete what he started at the cross, then we look at Romans 8, 33 through 39. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Satan is called what in the Bible? The great accuser. He's the one that tempts you to sin. And once you does, he wants to shine a big light on your sin. And he wants to take it to God, say, look, 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 look what he did, look what he did, look what he did. And you thought Satan was on your side. 
No, he tempts you because he wants to harm you. You understand that? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. What? Not us. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us as our high priest, Jesus, who walked our walk, is right on the right-hand side of the Father saying, I have walked their walk. And he intercedes with the Father on our behalf. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will doubt, discouragement can make us feel like we get separated. But notice what Paul says. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written. Now, who else said just as it is written? Oh, Jesus did in the wilderness when Satan was coming against him. It is written. It is written. You know how important the Word of God is in your life, Christian? It's, it, it, it's so that you know Romans 8, 33 through 39 even exist. And when you know it exists, when he comes at you with fear, doubt, discouragement, you can say, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm standing on the truth. I'm standing on the promises of God. Nothing can separate me from his love. That was settled at the cross. Amen. Verse 36, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things... We overwhelm it. What things? Tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through Christ who loved us. For I am convinced. And he wasn't intellectually convinced. He was experientially convinced. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is, the home, what is the helmet of salvation? The hope of salvation. That God is going to complete the process when his son returns. And my hope is fixed on Christ and his resurrection. That's my hope. My helmet shields me from those attacks that are meant to discourage. Listen, pastors get discouraged when people don't show up. And when they blow off church week after week after week after week after week, and they, it's this, it's that, no, it's this, now it's that, no, it's this. And I come, and I used to have horrible times because I'm like, where are they, Lord? Why aren't they here? And I had to, for 20 years, work on that in my life. And Trudy would coach me all the way in, in, into the parking lot. What a help me she was. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. You're... And I would be frustrated and I'd be angry and I'd want to quit. And I'd say, it's me, God. It's got to be me because if I was better, they'd be here. And all of that is the lies of the enemy. Now, truly, you'd like it if I was better, I'm sure. I'd like it if you were better. That, that goes two ways, amen? <laughs> Y'all think it's just you to me. No, 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 it's me to you too. Pastors can forget what we already know just like you can and if I don't open this book daily and meditate on the promises of God and when I realize that God what you ask out of me as a pastor is faithfulness and if I'm faithful to this standing here today you and God have the other parts Right? When you choose anything but church and it's like, oh man, I'll, you know, I'll, that's why, you know, hey, let's put our videos. I almost hate that because it just gives license to stay home in your PJs. Because we don't even understand what the gathering of the church is all about anyhow. It's so that we can minister to one another, love one another, encourage one another. That's what it's all about. How can you do that in your PJs at home? Well, my kids are only young ones, Pastor. Do you know how insidious Satan is? Can I just speak truth to you before I close? You want to know how insidious Satan is? Fifteen years ago, they never would have scheduled any sporting event on a Sunday morning. They wouldn't have even thought it. 
15 years ago. Never would have thought it. That's church time. Even if they're lost, that's church time. And then gradually, well, we'll do one, two o'clock, four. And then I think we can bump it back to noon. You know what they discovered? Is that church people weren't nearly as committed to the church as they thought they were. And they realized we can do it at eight, nine in the morning. It doesn't matter because they're going to go anyhow. And that's our testimony to a world. That God doesn't matter. Because we're doing it with our feet even when our lips say something else. And then if a pastor has the courage to say something like that, then he'll probably lose 20% of his body. Oh, you think I'm joking? But I'm not loving you well if I don't help to hopefully have the Spirit of God open your eyes. This isn't what you do when you don't have anything else to do. Or how about when we just stay up too late and we're tired? We're, we stayed up too late and, and, you know, Pastor, we didn't mean to, but we just slept in. Read Malachi. Read Malachi. When God asked those people, why do you give me your lame animals? You wouldn't do that to your governor. In other words, if you had an appointment with a dignitary, you wouldn't miss it. But what do you think of me? We abuse the grace of God, don't we? Thank God for it. And I'm glad my salvation is not based on my effort because I would fail God. Please put on this helmet of salvation. Please stay in the Word of God. Please. You are no match for the enemy without the armor of God. And every time we get our heads kicked in, what's horrible is that our witness suffers. And maybe one of the most haunting truths of all Scripture for me as a Christian is when Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, it's good for nothing but to be trampled under the feet of men, to be thrown out and trampled under the feet of men. It's not our salvation, friend, but it is our witness. It is the number one thing that we have to protect every day of our lives is our own witness. Amen. Because we're only usable by God to the level of our witness. So if at work you're the one telling the dirty jokes and, and passing on the, the smut-filled emails, and, and uh, how on earth are you going to talk to them about Jesus? Well, you're not, and you know you're not. And Satan has now sidelined you. And now even though you want to, you can't. And Satan's won another battle. We had the victory. But friend, we're losing a lot of battles. And here's the scariest thing to me as an individual Christian, as a pastor. You ready? Do you care when you lose a battle? I got a speeding. I've had two in my life, a speeding ticket. Two my whole life. I deserved both. One was, back in the day, you didn't have cassette things in cars, and I, was, I carried a portable cassette player because I had to drive to Wilmington, which was about two hours away. I had to drive to Wilmington for a, I was, when I was a professional with the Boy Scouts, and, and I got bored, and so I'd listen to preaching tapes. Well, that's noble. I'm listening to preaching tapes. And I was messing with one as I was leaving town. I was accelerating. But, I, you know, I'm down here doing this. I know, I know, don't even say it. <laughs> And I sped up too fast. Woo, 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 woo. And I never try and talk my way out of it, right? I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I I did it. Then the second one, (laughs) before cell phones, was when I was visiting a brother in the Lord at a jail in, in... Thank you, Princeton. And the sheriff was messing around and not letting me see him. And I didn't drive all the way not to see him, so I was waiting. And I was late to pick up Jillian every day after school anyhow at Hedges. <laughs> but I was waiting. I want to see my brother. And so I finally get to see him, and I look, and I'm, I get in my car. I'm headed back home, and I look, and oh, my gosh, I, I, there's late, and there's going to be what I'm going to be. 
So I start trying to make deals with God. God, I got to speed. My poor baby girl's waiting on me. I'm already going to get that look from her. You know, that look that even my daughter can give me. And I mean, I got to know the secretary on first name basis. And so I'm speeding like a crazed man. I, I'm down 64. I'm coming up through that new Harmony Way. And I'm asking God to let me speed. Well, you know, God answered my prayer because when I whipped around a car to get around, a policeman came up, a state trooper came up over the horizon. God said, yeah, I don't play that. So he stopped me and I was even later because I got a ticket. And from there all the way to picking up Jillian, I cried. I cried. Because I knew that was going to be in the paper. And I had harmed my witness. And my witness means everything to me. And so I got home. I came on Wednesday night. I don't know if any of you were here. And I bawled like a baby up here. And the answers I got to comfort me, wow, don't worry, I've had five of them. <laughs> and you mean well, you meant well, you meant well. What you really said is, I've hurt my witness more than even you have. It's okay. <laughs> I called the DA in town. My son actually ran his campaign. I said, what can we do to keep my name out of the paper? He said, well, you can... Pay 100 bucks to the policeman's fund. I don't know what it was called. but So I thought, good deal. I'll pay $100. <laughs> and the whole time, tears coming down my face, blowing snot bubbles, because I knew I had failed God. And even though the people loved me at AFM and they were going to be okay with me, I knew I had failed God. It ought to matter to us. Sin is no light thing. We got to care more about what God thinks than what the world thinks. And it's going to start when you put on that hope of your salvation, the helmet that's going to protect you against the arrows of fear, discouragement, doubt, temptation that leads to sin because you have feared, doubted, and become discouraged. We're in this together. I represent AFM. Newsflash, so do you. What you do reflects on us. That's why I used to tell my children, right? You don't want me to embarrass you, guess what? Don't embarrass me. You carry my name. When you leave this house, you carry my name. It matters. Well, guess what? I'm, I'm God's child. And when I leave my house, I carry his name. Amen. And it matters. And that's why I need to keep that helmet of salvation <clears throat> snug on my head. That I can look for the promise of his coming. And live a life. Because I didn't read to you 1 John 3, 3. If it's not too late, put it up there, Luke. And this is it. I'm closing. I promise. 1 John 3, 3, because we're going to become like Jesus. Notice what John says to these people. Uh, the third verse. And everyone who has what? This hope. The hope of our salvation. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. In other words, I can't ever be perfect like Jesus, but I should strive every day to be as perfect as I possibly can. I'll never do that without that helmet being snug on my head. I love you. I hope you have a great day in Jesus. Uh, remember, pray for Sherry and Ray. Sh ship them a text. Tell them you love them. And uh, men, I'll see you on Wednesday, chapter 4. Concentrate on the parable of the sower. May God bless your day. The shoe boxes are back here. Take as many as you think you can afford. Remember, each box represents a $10 fee. Uh, if you want to take two today and, and talk to your spouse about, you know, uh, can we work this more into our budget? That's awesome. Um, please, every box back here on this table represents a soul that needs Jesus. Father, bless this time. Bless your word. Thank you for 
the accounts in your Bible about men, flesh and blood men, who you've done great victories through, and yet still we have our moments. God, help us. Strengthen us through your word. Empower us by your spirit. Please remind us to put this helmet of, of salvation squarely on our head. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.